Well, welcome, everybody. Um, you can see the title slide right here. I'm Ed Friedman, Chair, Chair of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. This is our 26th year of doing the speaker series. And I'm um, going to move through a few slides. Yeah. All right. So, good. so for those of you that don't know, um, we are a unique organization in that we really take a holistic, holistic look at the environment here, uh, combining research, advocacy, education, and land conservation. And we'll just pop through a few slides here. Um, I don't see the waiting room people, Martin, so hopefully you could admit folks. I'm doing it. Yeah. So, thank you. <clears throat> So just some examples of <clears throat> some of the research we've done over the years, a major circulation study over a number of years. If you go online, you can, you can find current study a website and you can see um, uh, animated um, uh, animations of, of how water moves around the bay and how hard it is to get out of the bay. Ongoing uh, aerial vegetation land use studies with the James Sewell Company looking at land use and uh, vegetation changes over time going back to 1956. Um, we've used the cage bivalves to, to look at whether mills are still discharging dioxin or not and to, to uh, locate uh, PCB hotspots in, in the Kennebec, um, largely responsible for fish consumption advisories. Um, <clears throat> working on PFAS chemicals now uh, working on the shad stuff, which is the subject of tonight's program. So moving right along, <clears throat> again, um, one of the few groups that does some hardcore advocacy work. Um, we've just been suing Central Maine Power for a number of years. Uh, couldn't get Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, to take our, our case. No surprise, given the odds to get in. Um, but uh, again, <clears throat> working on PFAS and probably be doing stuff with the Brunswick Naval Air Station to try and stem the tide of toxic chemicals from there. Um, education, um, this has taken kind of a hit with COVID. Uh, we had a lot of in-school programs going on and uh, our outdoor bay days, uh, lots of volunteers, usually 40, 50 volunteers taking part in this. Uh, what we have done is now we're in the second year of working with a school, Bowdoin, Bo, uh, Bowdoin uh, Community School. Last year it was Bowdenham and Bowdoin, and and a theater group. So we are we are still working on this. this current series is someone's making a lot of background noise there. I'd say if you're not talking, maybe you can mute yourself. Is that, is that John? Maybe. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So we are we. This is education. We are working with kids still. Um, just completed another conservation easement. I think it's about our 14th or so, 30 acres, 36 acres on the Kennebec, um, about five, six acres of tidal wetland <clears throat> involved, uh, protected probably up to now well over 1,500 acres or so um, around the bay. And our focus is not on recreation for people and trails, it's on um, protecting a valuable wildlife habitat. If you know of someone who couldn't make it tonight, um, and they and you want them to see the program, we do record these. And uh, if you go to our homepage down here under education, you'll see a video list. And within a probably a couple of days or so, we'll have this posted there. And there's lots of others going back to, I think, 2010. Um, series for this year. Um, I'll point out that, that the next uh, next one here, Mauricio Handler is a sort of National Geographic uh, uh, caliber BBC uh, cinematographer, mostly underwater, but he's been working on him. And he's, he, if anyone saw the program on Patagonia on, um, was it uh, CNN maybe? Um, he did a lot of the filming in that. Um, he lives in Durham and he's been working with his wife for a number of years on a film about Maine. And this is going to be an intro to that arrivals like the horseshoe crabs, like the herring, like the elvers, et cetera. So it should be really good. And then uh, Will, Will Stolzenberg in January, where the wild things are, uh, what's happened to our predators. So moving right along, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight and then turn the screen over to them. But first, I do want to um, say a couple of things. If you've got questions during the program, 
please use the chat button down at the bottom of your screen or wherever your toolbar is. I think it can move around on the screen. So use that and, and probably Martin or a combination of us will try and uh, sort of field those at the end of the at the end of the program. We are recording. Uh, and I want to thank Martin McDonough, who's on on here for being our main tech tech uh, guy here, Zoom coordinator. Appreciate that, Martin. And so, without further ado, I will say that um, our Renska uh, Kirkhoff is is an international student from Belgium, studying at Bowdoin College. She's currently a junior and studying biology and Asian studies, and going off to China this next term. If I if I remember correctly. Um, she's participating in Bowdoin's marine science semester and in the spring planning to go, oh, let's go on, on to China. So um, she's interested in marine ecology and animal rehabilitation. And after her time with us working on Shad this last spring on weekends, she was interning at the Maine Wildlife Park. And I don't know if she still is doing that or not now that school's going. Um, John Lichter, our other presenter, is a professor emeritus of biology and environmental studies at Bowdoin College. And he's a former director of Bowdoin's environmental studies program and spent about 18 years studying the ecology and environmental history of Mary Meeting Bay with students and various collaborators uh, like us. Um, um, and, and I will say of, of all these sort of environmental professors over there, John's been about the only one to focus on the Bay and we really appreciate that. Um, now retired, um, John's thing is native plant gardening and outdoor photography. And his, you can see his really wonderful photographs at um, uh, johnlichterphotos.net. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and turn the screen over to John, who's going to lead off here, and then he'll pass it on to Renska at the appropriate time. So thank you all for coming. And John, you're up. John? John, you're mute. You're still muted. So you want to? I'm working on it here. All right. Well, now we can hear you. That's a start. OK. Go back over here. Gonna, go over here. Share, share screen. I'll choose that one. And I'll push the project. There you go. And then you can bring it up to the slideshow to make it go full screen. And uh, uh, no, I, I was at the end, like just like you oh, were. Like I did. That was quick. Yeah. Great show, John. Here we go. Um, awesome. as, as Ed said, um, um, it, uh, the Friends of Mary Meaning Bay has supported this research right from day one. Um, I remember um, just getting started after coming to Bowdoin. And most of my work uh, previously was in forests. And so anyway, I was looking around for a local site and uh, couldn't have found um, a, a better outdoor lab than Mary Meaning Bay in the river systems. And Ed showed me around to get started. We did vegetation studies at first. and. It, it just went on from there, one thing after another, whatever we found um, interesting and pursued it, you know, to some degree. Um, so a lot of support from the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Um, also the um, Doherty Charitable Foundation that uh, uh, supported Renska last summer, this past summer, and also the Schiller Coastal Studies Center at the college. And the Sewell Foundation provided the funds uh, to purchase the ARIS sonar instrument that we use for counting fish. Um, I have a, a few slides here just to kind of get across um, the beauty of the river systems and Mary Meaning Bay. And then we'll make the case for the importance of this, this system as an ecosystem. Um, these, this, some of these photos are from Heather Perry, who's a local professional. This is the, uh, inter, the, the intertidal um, areas below Swan Island. This is looking right out from Pleasant Point. This is actually on the Anders Skagen, but it could have been on Mary Meany Bay. Um, this is another Heather Perry showing ducks in the wild rice. Um, one 
So one thing we did um, was to look at all the documentary uh, historical information and papers that we could find on Marimini Bay. Um, one interesting one was um, called was titled "The Ducks of Mary Meaning Bay in 1905," and that happened to be in 2005. So we kind of uh, worked a class into the looking at the ducks out there. And anyway, this paper <clears throat> um, was in the main ornithological um, journal. Um, it described uh, a, a flock of black ducks that ran from the chops past Brick Island, all the way to the mouth of the Cathans. Um, well over a mile long, one flock of black ducks on Mary Meaning Bay up to, it was like in a ribbon, uh, possibly, you know, 50 to 75 yards wide. And so there was, a, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 ducks in one flock back at that time. So it was really quite an ecosystem. And of course, the, the uh, ducks and, and geese and so forth are coming in for the wild rice and other plants. It's a major uh, migration stop. This is another of Heather's um, photos, a uh, short nose. And these are some that we um, that I shot from mm -hmm. Brunswick um, Topsom. When <clears throat> the week we were uh, or started um, our survey on the shad, there were so many sturgeon jumping uh, the first day we went out there that I mean I mean there were literally dozens of jumps in the time a couple hours so it appears that Atlantic sturgeon and short nose sturgeon are doing very well um, recovering. Um, I've worked with students many students over the years. Um, this is Lucy Van Hook with the snapper. Um, a lot of the work was um, dealing with uh, small fish with so the beach sands, and I'll explain the reason for that. Um, this, um, can you see the pointer or not? Yes. Okay. Um, this lower one, we're um, transplanting uh, native plants to see if we, you know, if transplants would work. It was an experiment, and I'll talk a bit about that too. Okay, so. Um, again, we looked at the vegetation, both emergent and submerged vegetation, um, different um, animal species, mussels, snapping turtles, and then a lot on fish. Also, just the environmental history, um, we did a, a, a fairly uh, substantial study looking at the sedimentary record in Mary Meeting Bay. This is one of my research colleagues, Theo Willis, with uh, one of my classes. Um, he's showing them how to regurgitate the stomach contents out of a smallmouth bass so we can see what the bass were eating. Um, one thing, these, all of these Bowdoin students, at least in the, those in Mary Meaning Bay, they got to understand what real mud is like. That's something uh, Renska hasn't, hasn't um, experienced yet, but maybe she still will. Um, again, this is beach saning for small fish. Okay, um, this is a just kind of a cartoon or diagram of a marine food web, and so just to kind of think about this in a in a broad way, we have primary producers, uh, phytoplankton and aquatic plants and so forth, which are um, gather, you know they're taking in photo, uh, CO two photosynth uh, photosynthesizing and nutrients and so forth. The, th the first layer then is the things that eat them. And then again, uh, small things that eat the things that eat these. Okay, so one question, if we just start and think about this from first principles, we are basically fertilizing the planet with things that plants need to grow, like carbon dioxide, for instance. Also in a lot of places, nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, any river system has far more nitrogen and likely more phosphorus than it ever had uh, prior to industrialization. Okay, so why is it then that where the upper levels, other than um, overfishing, I mean, there's examples of things we don't fish for anymore, but they're, the populations are coming back, or at least haven't. Been. So if you think we're, we're adding to the bottom of the food web, you know, why isn't it traveling up to the top? And it could very well be that, well, one of these layers is just a bottleneck. And so that's uh, the idea. If you see at this first carnivorous consumers level, juvenile stages of fish and small fish and so forth. So these, these are the 
um, animals that take plankton and make fish tissue out of it. And so if it, the, our hypothesis is that's a bottleneck and it's actually influencing um, everything above it. So even though we're fertilizing the hell out of the base of this thing, all this energy and material can't go all the way up the food web if there's a bottleneck in the middle of it. Okay, this is, this is a, just a, 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 kind of a cartoon of it. This is what it really looks like. Uh, and if you notice, this, it says at the bottom here, a simplified food web for the Northwest Atlantic. Okay, <clears throat> it doesn't, it's simplified, but it's definitely not simple. This complexity um, is, you know, as a scientific topic, it's, it's daunting. And it really demands humility on our part because it is at something this complex, it is impossible for us to understand if we, you know, if we hit one species, what the cascading effects of that might be. So for instance, like if we knock eel waves out of this, it could have effects going up and it could have effects on things that AOIs were eating, dramatic, dramatic effects. Okay, one um, very fortuitous um, event was at, at actually, for me, was actually um, at one of the Friends of Mary Media Bay seminars. I met this guy, Ted Ames. And Ted is, has been a commercial cod fisherman, a lobsterman. Um, and in his later years, he became um, a scientist, a published scientist, um, working on reconstructing the ecological history of the cod grounds. And so this is basically what I'm doing is kind of setting up the big picture for Renska's study. <clears throat> and this is a big reason. Um, in addition to the river's importance on their, for their own part, they actually influence the marine food web in a big way. And so all these red circled areas are foraging grounds for cod and other um, ground fish that Ted has identified. And um, throughout the Gulf of Maine, there's roughly 460 of these. These are, these are showing foraging grounds, not spawning grounds. And one thing that Ted noted was that most of the spawning grounds tend to occur around the mouths of the rivers, of the four or five large rivers. <laughs> And anyway, he speculated that um, the, the collapse, at least the inner grounds, was related to the damming of the rivers and the loss of the anadromous fish coming out of the river every year. And, and so anyway, I got, to, I got with him and we started you know, thinking about this, what the consequences of this were, would be, and so on, and actually documenting it. Um, it's interesting that it, um, this was actually known in the 19th century by scientists at that time. This is Professor Baird, the general, and I'll, I'll just read the quote, the general conclusions which have been reached as a result of repeated conversations with Captain Treat and other fishermen on the coast and climbing to believe that the reduction in the cod and other fisheries so as to become practically a failure is due to the decrease off our coast of the quantity, primarily of alewives, but secondarily of shad and salmon more than to any other cause. And so this was basically forgotten throughout the 20th century. And we're just kind of coming back to it now, this understanding. Okay, so it isn't, this is another great picture of Heather um, Perry's um, alewives meat dam. It isn't just the um, human activities, um, or it isn't just dam building uh, of the human activities. Um, a lot of our, you know, just looking through the documentary evidence, we see, you know, some evidence for overfishing as early as 1710, the 17-teens. The sedimentary record clearly shows sedimentation rates beginning in the, in the middle part of the 18th century. And those sedimentation rates haven't really slowed throughout that time, they're just kind of continuing high. Um, dams, the uh, first dam at Brunswick was, I believe, in 1753. Um, agriculture by the 1780s, water pollution, 1860s, and invasive uh, species by the 1960s. So all of these things probably had um, a negative impacts on the anadromous fish and the system in general. Um, Sturgeon Island, uh, sturgeon were uh, probably overfished several times over the last couple hundred years. Um, when they diminished, 
the population would diminish, be over harvested, and they kind of forget about it for a while until they, you know, started seeing a lot of sturgeon jumping out there again, and then they'd start up the fishery again. Um, dams have a lot of uh, ecological effects in addition to blocking fish passage. Okay, so there, there's just a, a whole, uh, basically all of the river ecology is influenced by, by dams. Um, many of you probably know of the pollution history of the rivers. <clears throat> um, people, you know, a, a, a lot of people I know that have lived around here at that time talk about foam layers a foot thick and, and so on, really just egregious um, pollution from the um, paper mills, but also from municipalities with um, raw waste. Okay, finally, some data. Um, these data um, were from the DEP, uh, Barry Moore of the DEP let me in their, their um, storage room and I started digging through files and I found all of the um, dissolved oxygen measurements in the summertime dating back to 1948. This first data point is from an engineering study in 1931 that was pretty comprehensive of five rivers. Okay, and what we see here is the collapse of this ecosystem. Already in 1931, um, five parts per million of oxygen is questionable for salmon already. Um, but certainly by the time we're getting down to zero, this system is dead. There are fish kills many years that were noted in this time. And then with the Clean Water Act in 1972 and implementation in 1975 or 1976, where the raw sewage was no longer going straight into the river, there was a rapid increase in re recovery improvement in the dissolved oxygen concentration. Okay, so um, some properties like dissolved oxygen, maybe other some other chemical properties respond will respond really quickly or pretty quickly. What about biological properties? Um, this is eelgrass at the mouth of the Kennebec River. I'm showing eelgrass um, because the water's just clear and it's easier to get a photograph at the, at, in the seawater. E um, eelgrass is the marine species, but the river systems have freshwater species. Uh, tape grass is very similar to eelgrass and it performs the same ecological function. Um, there's also several different pond weeds. And so just to get the point across though, um, the, when the, um, the, e the eelgrass and also the, the tape grass in the river system provides habitat for lots and lots of small critters that, that support the food, basically are the base of the food web. There are things that fish eat, there are things that um, you know, eat algae and other uh, small things and they're, um, they, they're, they just do much better in the vegetation than outside in the bare sand. Um, we documented that, students. So again, it was very much learned by doing for me too. Um, we just collected samples, filtered them and so on, and students identified the end product here, which is, um, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of things in there, annelids, uh, little snails, isopods, all kinds of different insects in here. And so they quantified them. What we see then, um, the data here, um, this is a number of submerged vegetation. So I'm not talking about the wild rice and the, re and the rushes and so on in the inner tidal. I'm talking about this, the vegetation that's below the, that's rooted below the low water line, the low tide line. Okay. Cause if you're thinking, of, if you think about it, um, at low tide, if there is no aquatic vegetation, there is no place to hide if you're a small fish, right? Okay, it's, it's, and there are literally hundreds of papers talking about the importance of aquatic vegetation in lake systems. Far fewer in river systems and a little bit in estuaries, mostly in the Hudson and the Chesapeake region. Anyway, um, these are, uh, Friends of Mary Meaning Bay data from in their aerial photograph work when they uh, conduct the vegetation surveys. Going, I think this first one was 1956. And here you see the, the aquatic habitat collapsing. 
very similar to the oxygen, only it's kind of a little more drawn out and it doesn't recover quickly. Now what's happening here, water is getting so filthy that these plants are not getting enough light to, to um, photosynthesize. Push that button too soon. And so anyway, th these were published data, data in around 2005 or so. And it's only 3.2% of the available area at that time. However, there has been a dramatic improvement since then. Um, so these are the, the, those data that I just showed. And then a point in 2010, when we actually get, went out in boats and mapped all the vegetation, actually all the way from Fort Popham up into Mary Meeting Bay. And this is the same area from the previous data. And we see a, a, a substantial recovery at that point. In 2014, it just turned out that the Google um, Earth data happened to have been perfectly at low tide over Mary Meany Bay, and you can see the submerged aquatic vegetation. So another student for a class project looked, quantified the um, submerged aquatic vegetation, and uh, the point was way the heck up here around 900. Okay, so this is really a profound point. We all know and we've all heard about tipping points where if we're pushing a system and we keep pushing it, we're disturbing it, and it doesn't seem to change that much and we keep going, keep going until we pass some threshold and the system collapses very quickly. Okay, I mean the climate system, if, if we're lucky, you know, we're, if we're lucky we won't see that, but it's likely we will at some point. The climate system has lots of thresholds in it. But ecosystems, some ecosystems can act in the same way. Well, it's also true that some ecosystems will recover in the same way where there's a threshold at which if once it's passed, when we can get past that point, it'll just, the system will really respond quickly on its own. And that's encouraging. And I'm not saying that all systems will do this, but some will. And that's what's happening here. It's usually related to plants, getting dense enough such that they're changing the environment in a way that benefits them. There's there more of the seed is, is germinates and their recruitment is increased. Okay. Okay, so anyway, this is really recovering fantastically, Na a natural recovery. <clears throat> um, here are more data showing the effect of the vegetation. SAV is the vegetation and then unvegetated. Number of macroinvertebrates far more, number of species more, and the number of resident fish was like 30 times, they were 30 times more likely to be in the vegetation than outside the vegetation. Okay, um, the, the area of beds, you know, increased the biomass of um, macroinvertebrates and also the diversity. Okay, so the, the critters like the vegetation. There's a, the, the vegetation uh, collects silt, and that, and they like the silt better than the sand. And it also just provides refuge, so they're not eaten by whatever's eating them. They're less likely to be eaten by whatever's eating them. Okay, habitat recovery leads to fish recovery. Um, this is uh, Patrick M Millay. He was um, a Haitian student at Bowdoin, and he did an eel study. And what he found was, first of all, the eels um, tend to be in the veget or are always caught in the vegetation, never outside the vegetation. Apparently, eels know a lot about striped bass. And that's why they're in the vegetation. Okay, over here is the vegetation data again. And here are the DMR um, beach sand data conducted yearly. And this is eels. Basically, these are elvers that ended up in their surveys. And we see over this time period from 1985 to 2010, the period when the vegetation is recovering very quickly, the eel vet population is just showing the beginnings of a recovery there. Now, the data are very messy like this. This is always the case when you're dealing with animals in relic you know, just very small populations because it's hit or miss when you sample all the time, whether you get them or not. But anyway, this is encouraging. Okay, so just so far, 
the river is recovering dramatically its, its uh, ecosystem, its ecological function. Uh, and it's just really a matter of the pollution being stopped. And so in a lot of ways, if you know, if we get out of the way, nature will do it on her own. Some ways that's not true. Okay, we can't actually wait for nature to erode the dams away. We're gonna have to figure out something to do there. This is Nate Gray, a DMR biologist and also a board member of um, the Friends of Meaning Bay. This is Lynn Lewis, a research colleague of mine from, she's from Bates. And this is uh, data for, of Nate's that um, show passage of river herring, that's alewives and blueback herring going up the Sebastocook. Um, the Edward Stam was uh, removed in 1999, that didn't help that much, but the Fort Halifax Dam was removed in 2008. And then there were fish lifts were placed, installed on each of the three dams leading up to the lake. And so you see a very dramatic recovery. This is probably the premier example of fish restoration in the world right now. Up to, he had over 5 million fish pass one year. And he's been pretty much between two and four million since then. We haven't updated this graph yet. Okay, now what, why is this important? Again, this is, um, uh, this is a study from a master's uh, degree, Carolyn Hall. And what she did was to calculate the number, of, the original number of alewives getting to lakes and spawning before there were any dams. She used DMR data based on just how many um, alewives can be support, supported per acre of lake. And there were roughly four and a half or five million on the Andro, 20 million on the Kennebec, 32 on the Penobscot, and 25 or so on the St. Croix. Now, just to make a point, that adds up to 81.5 million adult alewives. Um, let's say half of them are females, that's 40 million. Each female has 125,000 eggs. That's 5.1 times 10 to the 12 eggs we're starting with. That's 5.1 trillion eggs. Now, a trillion of something physical that you hold in your hand is a lot of them. I mean, we, we get to hearing about the, you know, the national debt and things like that that are in the trillions and so forth, but actually a trillion is a lot of something. Assuming 1% survival, that's uh, 5.1 times 10 to the 10th, that's 50 billion little fish leaving with only 1% survival of, you know, from eggs to little fi juvenile fish. Those little juvenile fish weigh a gram, they're like four centimeters long, but there's a 5.1 billion, Billion, or 51 billion of them, that's 51,000 metric tons of fish biomass leaving the river systems and entering the Gulf of Maine every year. And that's why, in Ted Ames's view and mine, that's why there were so many cod in coastal waters originally, because there was a heck of a lot of food for them to eat. And by the way, cod, are they'll eat just about anything that's in front of them, but they are, they are built and evolved to eat fish. Um, now, how did Nate and others, um, you know, do this with fish lifts? This is the bucket on the, the first lift on, at Benton Falls. Um, I got a little video to show how this works. So this is a kind of industrial scale uh, project, um, not cheap. Um, I don't know if it work, would work at Brunswick, but it might. I shut the sound off, but you can hear that's a this is a um, bucket of water is really heavy. So this is a, a substantial a winch system lifting it up. Um, Nate says there's about 1500 alewives in each bucket. Um, the lift runs, you know, about every five minutes or so, it'll go down and grab it and, uh, you know, get, get more fish. The fish go into the bucket because the water's um, directed through it and they're going against the current, you know, into the bucket. He gets some shad in there, but not many really. Um, alewives come first and then blue bag. And so here they're dumped down a, a trough where there's a counting system where they have to they have to swim through PVC pipes where they're counted and then in, through a long trough and over the river and, or over the dam into the river up to the next one.
Okay, one more, oops, one more slide, and then I'll turn it over to Renska. Just to summarize, um, Maine's rivers and estuaries historically played an important role in supporting the marine food web. Whereas recovery of physical and chemical properties of the rivers can occur pretty quickly, recovery of the biological or the ecological components typically requires decades. That's just how it is. And there's not a lot you can, I mean, you can speed it up maybe like for instance, our transplant experiment would have been meant to speed it up, but it turns out that it was happening so fast we didn't need to worry about it. Okay, even before the nearshore cod populations were overfished, beginning in the 1880s or so, dam building and changes on the land were undermining the marine food web on which cod and other ground fish depended. This is a profound point because there's areas on the coast of Maine, um, up uh, mostly down east, where cod just haven't been recovering. There's no fishing for them. It's because there's no, there's not enough food for them to eat. Even though there's plenty of lobsters up and down the coast of Maine, they need they need um, to, uh, alewives and blueback herring and shad and so on. And so it may very well be if we really want a cod fishery, you know, that's anything that looked like what it was originally, or even a portion of that, we have to open the rivers up. And okay, in terms of anadromous fish production, Maine's rivers are far from their potential, but they're improving. Access to upriver spawning habitat remains a main major obstacle to further recovery. Now there has, of course, there has been a lot of work on the Penobscot and the St. Croix to get fish passage going. Okay, um, I am going to unshare, stop share, and allow um, Renska to put her file slides up. Yep. And I'll mute, mute myself for a while. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, is everyone is everybody able to see that? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So last summer I worked with uh, Professor Lichter and also with Ed Friedman uh, on a project about the, effic the efficacy of the Brunswick Topsom hydroelectric dam in passing American shad or Alosa sapidisma in particular. Um, so first I want to give you just a quick pretty boring background on shad. So there's a bunch of um, phylogeny there but Shad are anadromous fish, which means that they are born in rivers, then live in oceans, and then return to their spawning grounds, so where they were born, to spawn. And so they're found along the eastern coast of uh, North America. And to the right, you can see kind of an up-close picture of a shad. So in terms of environmental importance, the shad that come up the river actually do not feed when they are in the river to spawn but they do provide food to a lot of different species, including striped bass and harbor seals. And when they are out in the ocean, they feed on plankton, crustaceans, and other small fishes. And I think um, John did a very good job of put, bringing across the point that when we lose shad, we're gonna affect an entire food web. We're not just gonna be losing shad, there's gonna be downstream and upstream consequences. So for those, species that depend on shad as food, or those species that are eaten by shad. All of those are going to be affected if we keep losing shad. So there's this very interesting book by John McPhee, in which he calls shad the founding fish. And this doesn't mean that shad wrote the Declaration of Independence. But what it does mean is that shad were very important in feeding um, this nation's founders. So shad are often referred to as the fish that fed the nation's founders because they were a very important food source first for indigenous people and then later for colonists. So shad were a very important source of food to get those settling in the United States through the long winters. However, lately there have been some ongoing concerns um, and kind of concerning trends within the shad population. And of course, the main way that people usually notice problems is through an effect on the money that they're making. And so there has been a decline in commercial catch of American shad since um, the 1950s. 
And this problem was actually already noticed in the 1950s when Taylor wrote an essay on former shad streams in Maine, in which he stated that the disappearance of shad from the rivers and streams of Maine is almost entirely a result of their exclusion from spawning areas by dam construction. So we in Brunswick, as um, John already said, have a dam. We have the Brunswick Thompson Hydroelectric Dam. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of the dam and then the fish ladder, which is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's this ladder-like structure going up. And then to the right, I've made a little cartoon representation of that fish ladder and how it works. So basically the fish would be, well, so shad, what they're thinking of is they just want to swim upstream. And so what the fish ladder is, is there's water flowing down from it. So when shad are following the water that's flowing downstream so that they can go upstream, they would, in theory, enter the fish ladder and then they would be able to kind of slip off to uh, these little side parts to rest and that way they could make their way up the fish ladder. It is also important to note however that like most dams the uh, Brunswick Topsom hydroelectric dam has turbines that are often on to, <laughs> um, to generate electricity and these turbines do generate a curtain of bubbles as well, which might be confusing for fish. And so what might be happening is that shad aren't using the fish ladder or aren't effectively making it across the dam. And in that way, they are simply panicking and kind of spawning before the dam in less than ideal conditions. And so this is obviously going to have an effect on our shad population. Good news for us is that the dam license expires in February of 2029. And so this is a great time to start thinking about how we can prove that the dam is not having a good impact on the fish and that the fish ladder that's supposed to serve these fish is not serving its intended purpose. So what's the easiest way to prove that the fish aren't using the ladder. Um, we figured that it would be good to count the fish that are trying to get up the ladder and then compare those to the to the number of fish that did actually make it across. But you might be wondering, how do you count fish? Because that sounds like a very tedious job. So what we did is we used sonar imaging, this cool futuristic looking device is the Ares Explorer 3000. And so what it does is it emits sound waves. And when those bounce off of things in the water, it forms what we call a sonar footprint, which you can see on the right. And that allows you to see kind of silhouettes of objects and fish underwater. So we set this device up um, at the, the bridge near the Brunswick Topsom Dam. You can see the, the little red dot over there is our study site. And then the yellow beam coming out of it is what the sonar would have captured. So the range of the sonar is kind of giving like a pizza slice top view of approximately 20 meters of the river. And to the right, you can see the contraption that we had to keep everything from falling down, even though sometimes things did fall. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I've made a little drawing to clarify kind of this sonar footprint that we're seeing, because it might be a little confusing if you've never seen it before. So in the case of um, our study site, the current would be going from left to right. And what you're seeing is a top view of the river. So it's not like you're looking down into the depth, it would be like a top view straight ahead. And then the little gray spots you can see here are the rocks and then the things shimmying past, which I have some videos coming up, would be um, the fish. So I think it's important to note that you cannot see fish that are outside of this footprint. Um, and so, what I'm counting, which I counted both fish swimming upstream, downstream, and those that were circling so that we cannot be double counting fish. Um, but since we're not counting the fish that are outside of this small fraction of the river, 
we are most certainly underestimating the amount of shad that are trying to make it across the dam. And so I identified which fish were shad based on behavior and also size. So for example, sturgeon would be rather big, whereas shad would be much smaller and they would also move in a more shimmying way. So now I have a few um, videos to show you from, whoop. so first video is a um, bass following alewives. So you're gonna see a group of alewives coming in, which are the smaller fish. And then later you're gonna see um, the bass following them. And this is just some cool examples of what you're able to see with the sonar underwater. Renska, those are juvenile alewives. Okay, yeah, there's juvenile alewives. They're like an inch long. Yeah, they're tiny. <laughs> um, and then in next video, these are juvenile sturgeon, I've been told. <laughs> So I'm I'm not that good at being so sp specific with the fish, but I can tell shad from the other ones. So yeah, you can clearly see the outline of the fish and then their shadows on the rocks as well. And then lastly, um, this actually is this is very cool. So as John has shown you sturgeon like to jump out of the water and actually this is a underwater sonar view of what a jump like that might look like so this is slowed down so that you can really see it um, but you're gonna see the sturgeon entering the water with kind of like a splash like motion right there so that's the sturgeon entering the water again and then, of course, I had to also include a above water view of this, which is a video that uh, John took, which is very cool. We had we were very fortunate. We got to see a lot of sturgeon jump over the summer. Um, and people have been asking for years why sturgeon jump. And I don't think we have quite a clear answer yet. But from what I could find, the key hypothesis for now is that it's a form of communication to maintain their group dynamics. So meaning that these jumps are communicating something to other sturgeon, um, which is helping with their community structure. But I think it's a very interesting research topic. So it's time to look at the results um, from not only my summer, but also from data collected um, starting in 2017. So in 2017, Mira Prashad, another Bowdoin student, did the same research that I did last summer. And in 2017, on five days, she counted 14,218 shad that were trying to cross the dam. And of those shad, that summer, one shad made it across the dam. So that's a very jarring picture. In 2022, I counted a total of 7,633 shad that were trying to pass the dam. And of those, 224 made it, which sounds a bit more optimistic. But I went ahead and also counted um, the shad from the data that John collected in those years where he didn't have students helping him. And from that, I found that between 2017 and 2022, there, there were 20,616 shad trying to make it up the dam. And again, that's only in that one slice that we're seeing on the days that we're counting for approximately five or six hours at a time. Um, so that's a gross underestimate. And of those shad that were trying to make it up, in total, 897 made it. So that's a very, very small fraction of shad that actually made it across the dam and th therefore also closer 
to their spawning grounds. And that means that most shad are spawning in less than ideal conditions. So the implica implications of this are that the fish ladder that we have at the Brunswick Thompson Hydroelectric Dam is not sufficient and that an alternative must be sought. And I think right now is a good time to start thinking about this because in past years, there, there has been a lot of attention going to the dam and especially with the 2029 relicensing coming up. I think this is a great moment to foster that in community engagement and uh, go ahead and collect more data and garner more support. Um, so what is wrong with the fish ladder? Of course, it's hard to tell for sure, but we do know that salmon and shad are getting beat up as they're trying to use the fish ladder. And additionally, the proximity of the fish ladder to the turbines might be one of the reasons that some fish don't really make it to the fish ladder. Maybe they are seeing the curtain of bubbles that the turbines create, and they think that that is upstream, and so they head in that direction. So those are two possibilities. Um, I've heard from John that he has had conversations with local engineers that have implied that improvements can be made. Well, but there's also other alternatives, such as like the video show John showed of the fish lift, even though we're not entirely certain about how successful that would be for shad, but it might be a step up from where we are now. Of course, ideally, a removal of the dam would be great. However, it is also then important to think about what would happen after because there's obviously more dams upstream, but this dam could be a good um, example and a good first step in the right direction. And then lastly, of course, there could be changes to the current fish ladder, as I said before, such as changes to its structure or maybe its steepness in order to limit the negative impact that the fish ladder is having on the fish that are trying to pass. And all of this obviously depends on the 2029 relicensing. Um, so yeah, that's what I did over the summer. Thank you all so much for attending. And if you have any questions, I think now would be our time to answer them. Thank you, Renska. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. So if folks have a, a question, maybe you could stick them in the chat. If there's not too many, you could, we could probably have you unmute yourself, I guess, and just ask it um, since there's no questions in the queue now. So. You guys did such a good job. There are no questions. Everybody's stunned. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, this, as 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 we say at the end of the meeting, is you know, seeing none, hearing none, we entertain a motion to adjourn. Right. <laughs> so. Um. Oh, there's one. Okay, yeah. And there was one about a successful fish ladder. Um, I guess from what I no, I mean, I'm definitely not uh, an expert on dams and fish ladders, but um, I guess it's what you, what you mean by success. Um, the Andro, um, it's, I mean, it would, most people would, would consider that it works for alewives um, because a couple hundred thousand of them get up there and, and pass every year. Um, however, you, you saw from the data from Carolyn Hall that the, the river originally supported like four and a half mil to five million, which is a lot more than a couple hundred thousand. So I don't know that the ladder, I don't know that any ladder is going to work that well. And alewives are really terrific uh, swimmers too. It's amazing what they'll uh, swim up against. So that's a good question. I, I think there's a few issues there too. I think, you know, the the Benton Falls fish lift works pretty well, but it's still a mechanical thing and it takes a lot of frigging around with. Um, the issues are the mechanical pieces of it, the uh, attraction flow, attraction flow, you know, dr literally being that for the fish, they'd wanna go upstream, that confusion or uh, um, um, uh, differentiation from nearby turbines, as Renska mentioned with the bubbles, 
Um, and as flow levels change in the river, you've got to adjust the lift or the flows coming down through the fish ladder, either one. So they're all really poor substitutes for not having a dam there. And they've also found in the last probably 10 years that any more than three dams on a river and the fish, particularly Atlantic salmon, really take a hit. They're just using that much more energy to get up and, and over and through these fishways, um, getting probably traumatized a little bit when they get dumped in the hopper on a fish lift. And they, they just kind of run out of gas after a while. Uh, there are also issues with predation around fish lifts as fish are waiting to get in. Fish like striped bass or, or largemouth, smallmouth bass hang out, wait and try and scoop up you know, little fishies. Um, so I will say that the, the Saco River has a fish lift and actually they do move shad up through there. So there's a lot of particulars that are the particular to the site that may affect how well uh, the thing works. And it could be anything from the frequency that noises make and that affect the fish to the, the approach and the way the thing works. So anyway. So another dam, a question about the water level changes, John, obviously going to change the ecosystem upstream, but you want to address that? Uh, water levels with the, I mean, because of the dam? If you take the dam out, the impoundment goes away. Yeah, um, it sure does. And that's what it was like originally. <laughs> and that's what rivers are supposed to do. They're supposed to get really full in the spring and they just dry up in the summer. That, and that variability is like all of these organisms evolved with that kind of variability. We'd probably um, get a lot of or, um, organisms back with it. Yeah, one, one thing that's happened that you, you didn't quite touch on, but at the bottom of your food pyramid, all the phytoplankton and so forth, the, the, the primary producers that a lot of their nutrients are being blocked by the dams I mean, these are, these are, you know, most of the dams in Maine are running the river dams down low on the watershed anyway, meaning the water goes over the top in high water, but there's still stuff caught there. And, and in terms of the food web, you know, in the ocean, one of the, the primary producers are diatoms and, and the key ingredient that they need to grow and feed is silica, silica or the shells. And uh, silica generally originates in inland waterways and comes down the rivers and you block the silica, you, you starve the diatoms essentially, and you, you, uh, you basically short circuit the food chain right at the, at the lower level. So that's a, that's a big problem with uh, these dams as well. And, uh, and when the flows do come through, they're at the wrong time of year, they're typically in the winter when power companies are drawing down the impoundments to make room for the spring um, snow melt. So, but no one's feeding in the winter out in the ocean. Tipping point question from Vlad. What, what is it? Uh, oh, that's I right. it just says, John described tipping points. Yeah, is I do. Is there, can you see the question, John, or not? Um, John described tipping points. Is there a potential tipping point in the other direction, excessive vegetation growth and associated impacts? Well, I don't know if there would be you know, if too much, I mean, if you, um, in my experience, and I've done a lot in uh, plant communities, um, plants will be everywhere they can be if you give them enough time to be. So if you think about this, the system originally, um, I think it was probably chock full of, of aquatic vegetation and emergent vegetation from one side to the other everywhere. Now, and, and if the water's too deep, uh, plants won't get enough light. So maybe, you know, in the deeper river channels, the Kennebec is, is deep in places. Below the chops, it's deep in places like 90 and 100 feet. There's, there's not gonna be anything down there. But otherwise, I, I suspect if we were here in 1600, we would have seen plants from one in one side to the other. Question from Phil. I think you mean why are fish, fish ways or fish ladders so expensive? not fish dams. Uh, uh, well, uh, I mean, the fish lift is, um, that's an issue because it's uh, several million dollars to build a fish lift. 
and I mean, you see, it's a lot of a lot of steel and and heavy stuff there, and it's just um, it's going to cost a lot. The dam owners are not go on, going to want to do that if they don't have to. Um, egg, egg quality and how extreme the migration experience is. I'm there. There is some work on um, cod reproduction. Um, Ted Ted Ames looked into this and showed. So a couple of things um, that Ted showed. So it is true. Cod again, adult cod will eat just about anything. But I mentioned that they're they're designed, you know, by evolution and so forth to eat fish. Um, could there, there's some evidence that juvenile cod really need to eat, to eat fish, or they do not develop uh, quickly or as uh, healthily as uh, robustly as they would otherwise. Um, one of the last bits of work that Ted and I were working on, this is um, um, in Penobscot Bay. And it was a question about why are the cod spawning grounds where they are? And what we found was that they happened to be in, all of them, or at least those in our study area, happened to be in places where juvenile, juvenile alewives were hanging out. So juvenile alewives kind of come down, Mary Meaning Bay's nursery habitat for alewives, juvenile alewives. So they, they're kind of spending the summer. Even um, uh, we've had like two-year-olds in, caught in Mary Meaning Bays. Um, so they're eating there. They go out to the ocean in the coastal waters and they're not actually migrating with alewives for a couple, for at least a year anyway, maybe it's two years. And what we found was that the cod spawning grounds were where juvenile alewives tended to hang out. And the, the reason is it's not that the adult cods were eating them, but they need their offspring to have food to eat. And so it's the basically the juvenile cod were feeding on the juvenile alewives, and um, actually Atlantic herring were also in the uh, juveniles were in the same kind of uh, areas in coastal waters. Um, totally makes sense. Um, that's not exactly addressing egg quality, but it's about at least food quality for juveniles. Semi semi related to that, I, I did see a paper out of Canada. I think it was that actually looked at how lipid um, content or fat in the in the shed, in the shad affected their um, swimming speed. So yeah, it's important to realize that the 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 quality of their life, whether they get enough food, whether they can get where they're going, is going to ultimately affect you know other biological processes like. Um, uh, egg numbers makes sense. Makes sense. sense. You mentioned that it was it, it it is actually the lipid, uh, which lipids and the quantity and so forth that juvenile cod need to be eating fish to get, and not small lobsters or whatever else. <clears throat> I'll, I'll mention you. You had a slide, John, with Theo Willis um, um, forcing a some sort of a bass to regurgitate. Uh, one of our members. Um, Lives, been been living in Topsom all his life on the Androscoggin River, an old Maine guide. He was fishing with his son up on the upper, upper lower Androscoggin near Brunswick, and they caught some smallmouth bass and cut them open, and they found juvenile sturgeon inside. So, everyone's fair game. <laughs> Sometimes you can't win. Yeah. So yeah, do we put yeah or. or are we going to push to remove the Brunswick Topsom down? Yeah, um, I think that will certainly be on the table. Um, unlikely, that is a relatively big producer of kilowatts for uh, now Brookfield. It was, it was a central main power dam. Um, but yeah, that's certainly one, one option. Um, though This is a high profile dam, as you know, Jim, and there'll be a lot of people on this, a lot of NGOs on this. And uh, you know, first dam on the river is always a good target for for removal. And it may be in the next few years, there'll be enough alternative sources out there that the, the hit that Brookfield takes, you know, in, in shutting this down might not be as bad. Um, you know, of course, they want to have a dam just so they can have a dam. So 
So that may be a material. Um, other thing that could happen is a major redesign to more like a natural natural type down face or something like that, that, that could substantially improve the situation. But another, another thing that we didn't mention tonight is, you know, there's talk about a new bridge in, in Brunswick from Brunswick to Topsom and what effect will that have on the uh, fish passage there? So I don't, not following that in a big way. It's, it does seem like the bridge is going to happen. And one impact that it will have probably is that it's going to be moved. It's going to go to that large island in the middle of the river there below the dam. There'll be a central pylon there and come over and, and be a bit closer to the fishway now. Whether it's 25, 30, 40 feet, I'm not sure. But there's some concern about shading the fishway, the current fishway. And um, fish are very visual uh, in, in, in following cues to go where they're going. And so, you know, having it be darker and things less less distinct may may be a negative, uh, you know, may have a negative impact if the fishway stays where it is and if the bridge is built. Okay. Anything else? If, if nothing else, I think we'll uh, we'll call it an evening. I want to thank thank you, John and Renska, again very much for your work great presentation thank you all for coming and uh thanks to martin again for for handling the tech side of things uh and remind folks that uh this event happens the second wednesday of every month october through may we will have one exception in february this year but uh next one is december 14th and hope you can tune in there for some outrageous underwater uh, cinematography and and work that mauricio has been doing thank you all very much